Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and I'm with Gerald Ratner, and I'm also with the lovely Jane. And this is a live mentoring session. So Jane was very kind. She bought a bulk order of Reinvent Yourself. Jane, do you have a copy behind you? Of course oh, I do. Yeah. Magic. Yeah. So <laughs> um, it's called Reinvent Yourself by Gerald Ratner and myself. And Jane Lee, Jane Lee kindly bought um, <laughs> a few copies, a bulk order of copies. Um, and we did this little offer where if you buy a, a bulk order of Reinvent Yourself, Gerald and I would do a live mentoring session with you. Now, Gerald was doing something like two billion in the 1990s, you know, before things changed for him, shall we say. Uh, and of course, many of you know me and how many people I've helped and how I run an eight figure training business. And we have we have nearly a thousand units in our property portfolio under management that we own, co-own our property companies manage for us. So hopefully Gerald and I have got some good experience. I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years to help Jane and Jane's going to ask us some questions. But if you'd like to grab a bulk order of Reinvent Yourself, DM me with the, the proof and maybe you can get on a live mentoring session with Gerald and I if you think it's useful to you. So, Jane, do you want to do a quick intro and then Gerald and I are here to serve you? Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. And I appreciate having the second time go after the tech situation. So my name is Jane Sprose and I run the Jane Sprose and Consultancy. I've been in the business of dentistry for 30 years and aesthetic, facial aesthetics for 20 years. Um, and I have had my own practice, dental practice. I'm not a dentist. Uh, it's all business side, um, although my husband's a dentist. And I also um, have had three skin clinics. I've ended up as a freelancer. It suited my life at the time. It no longer suits my life. I have seen a uh, business opportunity in, uh, well, not just dentistry, far beyond dentistry, but I know I'd rather start with where I know well. And um, there's some questions I'd like to ask you to get some guidance on that, please. Let's okay. do it then. So, um, uh, so what, what I've seen is, in the dental market, a lot of dentists are in um, practices which aren't really fit for practice, to be honest. They are in properties which are not purpose built. And that's how I set my practice up in a, in a business park and, it, and I was able to get the environment right for the patient. But most dentists in the UK are in old houses or um, uh, just old buildings and they're having to compromise on what they've got. Now, there is a model which I started up 20, 20 years ago of having a patient advisor or a patient care coordinator or a treatment coordinator, which would, which would be a little bit like a personal banker. So you've got that one point of contact so that they can sell uh, the patient treatment plans without being in the chair. Because the last thing a patient wants is to be listening to money when they're in the chair and they don't like going to the dentist anyway. So we've got this approach, this process whereby they would be um, they would be uh, pre-qualified, if you like. Then they see the, the dentist and then they come out again. There's a lot more details to it, but I, I train a lot on that, on that actual role in a practice. So it increases sales. Now, what has happened is I've seen that practices don't know how to get the right person to do it, don't know how to train them. And I, there's only one of me and I can only do so much of that. And I see an opportunity of a remote virtual TCO, patient care coordinator, so that they become part of the team. And I provide that service, have a group of people, and they pay me. Yeah. But I'm struggling at the moment with should I do it as a membership model? Should I, if I, if I do do that, um, am I limiting the income because I can only charge so much? And then if, if I've got somebody who's really red hot and they're converting £50,000 treatment plans, there's a, there's a big difference between a £200 filling and a £50,000 full rehab, mouth rehab. Do you see what I mean? And I'm just wondering what your advice would be to pitch it to, to the market. Right. Could you summarise that in a sentence or two? Because that's a lot of information for Gerald and I when we don't maybe know your business as well as you. Sure. One to two sentence summary questions and we'll give it a go. Okay. So would you, because uh, this, this is a regulated business, so it's quite tricky to do. Would you go to the market with a membership model 
or with a flat fee with a percentage commission. Okay. And you said you thought the membership model would be what? A couple of hundred pound a month? Yeah. And then, but you thought the upfront fee or the one-off fee might be 50,000? No, the, the, so we would convert the um, patient treatment plan. So the tra patient treatment plan could be a value of anything from 200 pounds to 50,000. What's your average order value? This hasn't been done before. But, okay. So this no, is like no, new, no one's done this. No one's doing it. People no have, one in the industry. I have done my research. I can't find anybody that's doing it. I've found people who've thought about it. And I know somebody in the States who's trying to do it. Well, what's the difference between this and PPP? For, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's insurance for dentists, just like there is PPP. What, how does this differ from a normal uh, insurance plan for, for dentistry? Um, there, the insurance is a, an American-based model. Over here, it's more capitation or membership. And that is um, that would be where they pay the patient sorry they pay the practice um say like 20 up to 50 pounds a month to have their uh, treatment covered this is new patients coming in so you convert the new patients and then you convert them to the treatment plan that's been offered by the dentist most dentists can't talk money they have got have got poor communication skills and they don't have the resources in the practice or frightened to take on that extra amount of um of staff so I just want to get this clear before I give any advice so I don't give the wrong advice. So let's say I've got my dentist up the road. Yeah. I go from have a checkup from time to time and I might have to have a filling. In fact, recently I did stupidly in the um, lockdown. I was advised that I had a bad uh, decay in one of my teeth and I ignored it completely. Uh, thinking, well, it's just because he charges a fortune that, you know, he's just trying to get draw up some business. And then I got the most excruciating pain and I went there and they couldn't take the tooth out because of the lockdown. And in the end, they had to take the whole tooth out, cost me a fortune. Then I had to have a bridge and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, that's my, me being stupid. But how would that work? How would that, how would I have to avoid this huge bill that I've now had with the dentist? Okay. Well, that's a different conversation, really, yeah. Gerald. Um, so, I, that would be getting people that so I wouldn't be covered. I wouldn't be covered uh, by your scheme by that. It, no, this is not. It's a completely different concept. This is B two B, not uh, this is B two C. Sorry, B two B, not B two C. So what I'm offering is to the dentist that I will convert the patient to become their patient in the practice, and I will convert the treatment plans. They'd be able to. They'd be able to convert like, the ordinary everyday dentistry, but when they're looking at Invisalign braces, if they're looking at implants, high ticket items, yes, um, full mouth rehab, that sort of thing, they don't necessarily have the expertise or the resources to do it where I do. Right. Um, so yours is a different conversation, I, and I can do that on a separate note, and I'm sorry they did that, but pr a private dentist should have been able to give you what you needed, by the way, just saying. Okay. I wish I'd known you before so I could have helped you. <laughs> No, it's all right. I don't want to bring my own personal problems. <laughs> okay, so uh, obviously Gerald and I aren't in this business, so I can give you a helicopter view. So if let's say I was going into a business that was new like yours, the first thing I'd do is try and find all the competition and research them. Yeah. You, you said there isn't many. Um, I actually just acquired some team members from a company that I've known of for 14 years and didn't even know they had these team members. So the reason I'm saying that is I'd go deep on the research. You may find some companies that you didn't know were there, or at least you might find some similar companies. So that'd be step one. I step have a similar company, yeah. Okay, I'd go deeper because I'll bet you this stuff you haven't seen. Okay. Okay. It just always is. I mean, there's such a big, deep world out there. The next thing is I, I, I personally would think about your outcome. So yeah. the upside of a recurring revenue model is a multiplier valuation. So um, if you get to a certain level of income on residual, then you're going to probably get a high multiplier on a sale because it's yeah. gar virtually guaranteed income. Yeah. 
So you find that the multipliers are often much higher. I mean, there's this business is called SaaS business, software, software, software service businesses, basically. And a lot of people like getting into them because they can get really high multipliers on exit because the revenue is pretty much guaranteed month by month. Yeah. So if you were looking to build to sell and get a big exit, you're probably wise to go on the recurring model. But if you wanted to generate more short term cash or you didn't necessarily have an exit model, you might be more wise to go for the, you know, pay as you go, pay what they what they get. Mm -hmm. The other thing you could do is you could give them the option and have a, an option A and an option B. I often find that I'll often, for example, let's say it's a mentoring program and it might be ten thousand pounds. Well, it's £10,000 or it's £12,000 on a payment plan. So option one is cheaper, but option two is more flexible. So you might offer them the flexibility of monthly or a lump all up front, but they get a reward for that and they pay less. And so, yeah. you know, you may get some on the residual and some on the lumpy. The next thing you want to do, Jane, over time is you want to track lifetime client value. So... Basically, how much does a customer spend for their lifetime with you? Now, obviously, the longer you've been going, the higher that is. But if if a lifetime member spent three thousand pounds with you, then a few hundred pounds a month gets you there in a year. If the average client spends thirty thousand pounds with you, then the residual model is probably dangerous for you because it's got to take you like ten years to get to that lifetime client value. Therefore, you might want the more lumpy fee approach. Yeah, yeah. So, so they would be the general ways I think you can get to your answer. That's that's really valuable. That last one because um, I've been looking at um, the routes to market, and I see it as boom, boom, routes to market. <laughs> so I've been looking at it from um, people who haven't got the right building, corporate uh, corporate practices. People who just need an extra pair of hands, maybe they've got a massive campaign going on, they don't want to employ somebody, they just want somebody temporary. So I like that because that would fit in with what you've said. No, that's that's really great. Um, if Where would you think I should go with this? I mean, I, I could start on my own, but I like to get things, I like to go all in and really accelerate. Um, so, but I haven't ever done it with other people's money. I've only ever done it with my own. Um, what would you say? Do I need to start it? Would I be better off starting off proving the model or just going for it now with the contacts I have or anybody that you think, where should I start to get other people's money? I think what you should do before you get anybody's money is you should test the market. You should go out there and start selling. What you don't want to do is start getting a whole lot of investment for something that at this stage and a lot of expenses surrounding that. I think, you know, You've got to see whether you've got to be in a position with uh, when you go to investors that you've already spoken to customers and you already have them lined up that they're interested. So there's no reason with this. I mean, it's not as if you'd, you know, you have to go with with any product or anything. You're just talking about what you've got, uh, which costs nothing. So I would definitely uh, produce the literature, whatever, which costs very little, go mm -hmm. to them, and then you're going to find it a lot easier to get investment from outside when you've already got perhaps 20 or 30 customers that are on board for it. And you can get customers on board for this without spending a penny, without, you know, build, without making too much of a thing of it, without yeah. you know, tiring staff, taking premises and all yeah. of that. You know, the, I always say to Rob, um, you should kill the bear before you sell the skin. But I totally disagree with that. I actually think you should sell the skin and then go out and kill the bear. So you can <laughs> then, uh, uh, sell it the skin no, first. It's a great show later. Yeah. You, know, and if you, you, you don't sell it the skin, then go out and kill the bear. Not that I would kill a bear, by the way. Just put that on record. I know. <laughs> Gerald's analogy, and I wouldn't kill any animals either. But if you went and tried to sell bear skin and you ended up finding out that sheep skin was the market, yeah, that's often the case, isn't it? Yeah, so, 
Yeah. Also, I think once you've got a, a critical mass of customers, and it doesn't have to be very much, it could be 20, it's going to be much easier to raise the money because you've yeah. got proof of concept. Now, Gerald, yeah. Gerald actually did this. So, Gerald, tell us the story of selling the memberships of the gym before you even had the building because you've done this yourself. Exactly. And, and I think that, uh, you know, they, they say eight out of 10 new businesses fail. So why invest all that money when the odds are against you? Uh, see whether I want to be absolutely sure whether it's going to succeed before I put my hard on money into it. But in my case, I didn't have any money because I lost it all at Ratner's when I got the sack and uh, made my speech. But that's a story for another day. But um, yeah, so I felt the one thing that was keeping me sane was uh, health and fitness, cycling and stuff like that. So I wanted to go into the health business and that was in 1997, but I didn't have any money. Rob's quite right. But I found a really good site, which was an old book warehouse, but it was three quarters of a million pounds, so which I didn't have. But it cost nothing to put it in solicitors' hands, which I did. Uh, no way could I complete on that deal or even put a deposit, but I wouldn't have to do that for a few months. In the meanwhile, I then put an advert in the local paper, which cost me 200 quid, saying that the club would be opening in the next three months. And very generous of me, considering I bought the place, I would waive the joining fee. On the basis of that advert, with an artist drawing, which made it look absolutely fabulous. And by the way, it never looked anything like what it looked. You'd have forgotten my artist drawing, uh, which was marble floors and big swimming pools and stuff like that. But anyway, on the basis of that advert for a non-existent club, I got 850 direct debits to sign up. And that enabled me to go back to the bank and and raise the cash, which I would never have done without those direct profits. So I sold the, the skin before I shot the bear. Uh, and also you need a bit of luck because actually the bank manager's wife was one of the people that had joined up. So, you know, you did, <laughs> Rob recently says you did, luck does come into the equation as well. And um, what would you think about running a part? Because 20 is actually quite a big number because it- I it just is, made it up. A yeah, it'd be quite amount. intensive, but- um, you, what I'm thinking is what number would be right to prove it? And would I be best off uh, doing a pilot with some dentists to, to prove the model and they could get it slightly cheaper um, because it's like the, fir the first, the early adopters? What would you think yeah. about doing that? I can answer that one, Jane. I, I mean, people's pricing is often linked to their confidence. Yeah. And people think it's linked to the market yeah. um, and other things, but it's just often linked to their confidence. So as a wise model is what's called price escalation where you could have five say or x number jane but a small number of founder members who get more access to you for support and a better price and the reason they get that is because you're building up the model and the reason you do that is to get them as early adopter clients and kind of use them as your case studies and to yeah. a certain degree, your crash test dummies. Obviously, you've got to have a certain yeah. standard, but you're, you know, you're non-perfect. Yeah. And, then, and, and you tell them that you're looking for five founder members only or your yeah. first five clients will be on X discount. And then when you get to your five, you increase the price a bit. And then when you get to the next five, you increase the price a bit or 10 or two, whatever the number is. Yeah. And you yeah. price escalate. And the benefit of that is it creates fear of missing out because a client will go, if you just say, hey, I've got this service, they'll go, yeah. okay, cool, I'll think about it. Yes. But if you go out with service and only the, the next five get it at X price and then I'm putting it up, now they're more interested. They, well, they go from interested to committed. So um, that's the model I would use. So get whatever number is comfortable to you that you can work on a bit more personally and really give them a good service and really get them proven then increase the price at each level. And then, you know, you get to a certain number and then you can go to private investors and say, hey, look, you know, I've got these 10 clients. They're all paying an average of 10 grand. If we multiply this up with the number of clients and then we put an earnings, uh, you know, price to earnings multiplier on top of that, that will make the business worth X. Please invest Y. I'm making notes here. So excuse me. <laughs> I think it's this important. Is session. Yeah. It's important. <laughs> Go to see these uh, potential customers, not with the uh, giving them the impression that this is like some startup that might or might not happen. 
it's got to go with you know that you give them the impression you've got huge investment behind you this is a very very serious business uh whether it's going to go with you or whether it's not going to go with you i mean i know yes. that some friends of mine who started goo gu the d- desserts expensive desserts they started the business basically by taking some empty some packaging to tesco's and sainsbury stuff like that and gave the impression of this big factory in belgium or somewhere making these fantastic cakes. they didn't go with an empty box and saying well if you buy it i'll i'll start uh, i mean I, I know i'm stating the obvious but it's very important mm-hmm. because you are going to these uh, clients basically without a business behind you that you give this impression you don't give yeah. that impression I think I have got the credibility there because I've been in dentistry for 30 years and I've got a good network and I've done a lot of um, a lot of work with a lot of people. So I yeah. think the credibility is there. So that's a plus. For sure. It's a big plus that you've been in the trade, you've been in the industry. You People hate it when you, you go, because this is a specialised industry, dentistry. Very much so. Yeah. Very regulated, yeah. When outsiders come in and tell them, you know, how to reinvent the wheel and all that sort of stuff. So I think that... Uh, puts you in very good stead. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. Um, in the, Jane, in, yeah. why do you look at your next question? In this niche, it's probably going to be relatively easier and a shorter time frame to build a personal brand to own the space. Like if you wanted to build a personal brand to be the personal development expert or the entrepreneurial go-to person, that's going to take you 25 years and you're going to need to be worth half a billion. But, you know, in your space, like you said, it's very niche and very specific. So I definitely focus on putting content out on social media and building a personal brand around you because it's going to be much easier, not easy, but easier yeah, yeah. to um, own that place from a personal development perspective, yeah. Sorry, from a personal branding perspective. At the moment, Rob, I have got a room, um, Women in Dentistry, and there's a, re- there's a couple of reasons I did that in Clubhouse because... Um, one, I want to support women in business, you know me. And the other one is um, that there are more women in dentistry than there are men. So it would seem to me that, you you, you know, you're getting those. Out. Now, that is a specific room. Do you think I should do another room specifically on this, on the whole uh, patient care coordinator role that we would be selling, the virtual one that we'd be selling? Or uh, just keep my pie powder dry right now? Um, I see all clubhouse rooms as a test. Right. Uh, And the more specific the title, probably the smaller the room, but the more curated and qualified the person in the room. So I'm testing some broad and general titles and then some more specific titles. Uh, And so to that end, Jane. A room is going to take you, if you start a room and it has three people in it, you can run it for half an hour, an hour, and you tried it. If you start a room and you get 50 people in it or more, because you don't need many people in a room to, no. um, you know, monetize it. So I would definitely consider starting to test rooms. It's World Book Day tomorrow, and I'm doing two separate rooms on books, one called World Book Day and one about authoring. And um, I do two to three podcast rooms a week, and that generally generates 15 to 18 inquiries for our podcast agency. And then I do the more broad rooms like Money Monday or Ideas into Income, which gain my followership but don't really generate leads. So I would definitely test some rooms and test some titles and test some times. Okay, okay. And the next thing really is, I mean, I know the area pretty well. So it's more of a case of I don't know what I don't know. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm green. I'm going into invest to see investors. What are the do's? What are the don'ts, please? You mean, do you mean yeah. when pitching or trying yes. to? Yes. Okay. I, I think, uh, firstly, to get the numbers right. Yes. You're not going to be giving the same percentage of the business to the investors that um, the management have. So perhaps, Rob, you, I would say that if I was looking for investors in a venture, uh, if they were going to put in 20%, if I was going to give them 20% of the equity, I'd want them to put in 40% of the cost of the consideration of the business, something like that. Uh, you'd want to, you know, I think you've got, to, you've got to at least expect them to only receive half the cash for the percentage that they put in to start with. Um, then 
you've got to you've got to find them. Yeah. Uh, what I did was. Do you have accountants? Yes. Are, yeah. Are they a small firm or a reasonably big firm? And they they're a small to medium. They they are specialists. They're healthcare accountants. Because I found well, I I went through various different sources to get from different ventures. And the one that I found quite successful was actually the people that dealt with my accounts, the BDO, BDO Story Haywards or the Ernst and Young, those sort of people, because they're yeah. continually dealing with clients that are asking for advice. And with interest rates the way they are, there are so many people, so many of their clients that are looking for investments. But obviously, they're looking for very yeah. big returns. Yeah. I've got some contacts in Jersey, uh, in the Channel Islands, because I used to work there. So obviously it's big in finance. So that might, would you think that's a good place to start? I think it's a perfect place. To, I mean, I do quite a lot of speeches in Jersey, and it's a big investment community. Obviously, for for obvious reasons, no tax, um, and they are looking desperately. I know at the moment uh, for in, investments, and I do think that you know the fact you've been in the as I repeat myself, the fact you've been in the, in that industry. It's a specialised industry. It's so important you've got that knowledge. Uh, that's something you must really push with the investors. But it's not going to be easy. It's like everything else, you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you, when I, whenever I'm trying to raise cash, I always get turned down at least half a dozen times. Okay. Uh, but don't get despondent because if you're, t it's the average is about seven or eight. So you have that's to be, true. you have to go through being turned down five or six times. Uh, yeah. Don't go back and say, "Oh God, I've been turned down again." Say, "Oh, that's good. I'm nearly not at to number seven, which is where I'm more yeah. likely." To get yeah, to that's just part of the course. It's uh, doing a Walt Disney, I guess, isn't it? He got refused a lot of times. And so did the Beatles. You know, it, yeah. you get refused, uh, and it's nice that when you make the business a big success, which I'm sure you will do, uh, you look at those people that uh, turned you down. Yes. Yeah. So again, I've yeah. just written on the screen there a, a little model that will help you pitch better and that's opportunity story model return ask so you start with what's the opportunity that you're offering yeah then you br very briefly tell your story yeah and, and and how it's linked to your model which is the third part which is what is the business model yes and then what return and benefits do they get? And then fi fifth and finally, it's what's the ask? What are you asking for? Would Would you take somebody in with you to the investors? Because because I don't have that experience. Um, for what? The experience for what? Go and pitch for for investment, um, apart from getting bank loans and stuff like that from other businesses. But to private investors, would okay. you? Take Somebody yeah. else who is good at negotiating in that area, or is it worth paying somebody to do that? I'm I'm not sure how to do it. I think what they like to talk about is the is the balance sheet, the finances. So if you're not yeah. a, an accountant, bring a financial person. Don't bring anybody other than a financial person who can go through all the numbers that you've gone through them. But Rob, as you're a football fan, uh, you will resonate with Tommy Doherty. He always used to say because he kept getting the sack and going to another job. Uh, this is a bit like trying to get investment, that one door closes and another door slams in your face. And that is what it's like <laughs> in one investment. Yeah. Uh, it's not one door closes, one door opens. It's one door slams in your face and another door. But you've got to, the whole key to this is to continue till you get it. And you will get it, I'm sure. Yeah. It sounds like a Jane, yes. I, I would not take anyone to pitch because you should be able to pitch your you're asking for the money you should be able to pitch uh, but i would take either an advisor or an accountant who can do the legal or the the thorough numbers yeah but the actual pitch and the ask that should be you yeah that's what i'm saying bring an accountant yeah, yeah. you do yeah. Don't let them pitch. sorry they'll ruin, they'll ruin it if they try and pitch you you're oh no i'll do the pitch yeah happy at pitching because i know inside out i know everything but if they it's like um with analogy i could give is like when i did my chartered institute of marketing and all these kids were in the room it was like i don't know what they're talking about you know and i'd done loads and loads of marketing just not not digital marketing but when i came when they explained what it was i thought well i do that anyway so i don't want to be caught out looking as though i don't know about the business side when i'm doing it anyway does that make sense 
Absolute yeah. sense. And I mean, I, do, I, I was always bring an accountant, as Rob says, because I know nothing. I'm not a great person at reading a balance sheet at all. You know, and I'm sure you've got expertise in, in other ways, but not perhaps. No, I'm, I only do finance for, fun, for non-financial managers. I'm not a finance manager. I just make the money. Yeah. That's exactly. You can't, you can't be all things to all people. No, no, that's good. Right. Okay. My next, am I okay? More questions. I've been, I've got so many questions. Is that okay? I'm yeah, we've got a few more minutes. Okay. The next one is that interim situation where I need money now because my circumstances have changed and, but I'm, I'm working for money later. So what's the, what's your best advice to keep it all going, pay the bills and all the rest of it? but not lose sight of what I'm really going for. How, what's the best way to sort out my time and balance that? And when do I tip over and go, right, that enough is enough and I move on to the next bit? I would next. probably try and get a few um, cash paying clients as quickly as you can. So if you remember, I talked about price escalation model. Yeah. I also talked about, having a best price for cash and then a slightly higher price, maybe up to 20% premium for paying in installments. So from everything you've said so far, I think your best bet for both short and long-term benefit is to sign up a few clients who pay in cash as quickly as possible. And if the trade-off means you give them a good deal, to create cash flow and liquidity to be able to pay some bills and to scale a bit faster by reinvesting, then so be it. But that's how Mark and I grew our business. We went and sold some properties and got a deal packaging fee. And then we went and sold some courses when we had enough experience and got money in the bank. Because yeah. after with property, it's money later. But with yeah. business and selling products and services, it can be money now. I yeah. refrain from distracting yourself and doing other things because it sounds like you're in a position to launch this pretty soon. So that's what I would do. Right. Okay. Expenses down to at this stage, keep your expenses down to an absolute minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, cash is everything. You don't want to run out of cash really. Halfway yeah. through. The, the other thing is, um, when you, I mean, I've obviously, this has gone live and the people are hearing this and I'm hoping that nobody's going to run it before I do. So um, what sort of legal things should I be putting in place when I go to other places? Because I have been screwed over a number of times by a number of people and I don't want it anymore. Well, what do you mean? Uh, well, they've either taken the idea or the other ones don't matter. But in this case, it's about they've taken the idea and they've run with it before I was able to get it to market. So, so how do I, how do I um, lock them in legally, or is it not worth the paper it's written on? It's not worth the paper it's written on. I mean, that is just the, it's the wild west out there. It's a fear of the junk. It is going to happen. There's a risk, but you don't want to get involved with lawyers. They're too expensive. I never write. I never sign a contract. When my speaking, they always say, um, you know, the contract's on its way. I say, don't bother because it's not worth the paper it's written on. Because the people, the clients can cancel, and I can't do anything about it. So why they're just doing it for their benefit? There's no thing. I hate mm. signing contracts. I hired an advertising agency re recently. They said, "Well, we're sending you our terms and conditions, so you can sign the contract." I said, "No, I'm not signing anything." Uh, but they said, well, "This is normal cap practice. All our clients do so." I said, "Well, don't have me as a client." But you know, and of course, they don't want to lose my business. So all this is all for sake of lawyers, so they can make money out of it. Um, unfortunately, there is a risk, but by doing any precautions, in my view, it's costly, and it won't actually, at the end of the day, save you from getting yeah. turned over anyway. Okay. You don't want to get into a whole legal battle if they did no. anyway. It's no. just a risk you take. So yeah, I just I away from lawyers. I agree with Gerald in most scenarios and probably this one, Jane. It depends, of course. And a lawyer will cost you for, for some kind of IP protection or business model protection. That will cost tens of thousands of pounds, tens of thousands. And it will take a long time. 
And I often think your best protection is to be better and quicker. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now on Clubhouse, there's a particular group that are copying a lot of my titles and the way I run oh, rooms. See that. <laughs> yeah. See that? Yeah. What can I do about it? Message them all or send them a letter yeah. or just be quicker and better. Better. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. That That's p p now, of course, you, you have to have a certain amount of um, legal compliance. So we're not being flippant about saying don't get any advice. But when it comes to your products, your service and your offer, it's really hard to protect those things in IP. You have to have something unique. So inventions are easier, but information, that's much harder mm -hmm. unless you've got a very unique and specific way of doing it. Yeah. Now, if you've got a unique and a specific way of doing it, then create IP around that. And so they can copy what you do, just not how you do it. Got you. Yes. Okay. Um, so have I got time for one more question? One more for you, Jen. Oh, you're so good to me. Um, so with regard to service level agreements, because we've talked about not bothering contracts, but in the area of a very um, uh, regulated profession, there would be an expectation of a contract with a dentist. So you would say, do that, yeah? Because that's... Yeah, I I think you should have an SLA, definitely. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and, you, you know, you, you you may have a contract between you and your client. I mean, that's normal if you hire a lawyer, for example. Yeah, yeah. It's just about the nature of being able to fully legally protect your business model that we were referring to. Yeah. But I definitely have a service level agreement and some kind of um, contract that you'll sign with your client that, of course, well, they'll probably want it to bind you to, to some responsibilities as well as them. So, for example, we have a consultancy type agreement, an SLA, if you like, for our trainers who train for us. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that would that in your world, that would probably be quite normal. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and you'll probably iterate that over time. And yeah, you'll, you'll rack up a few lawyers bills. So you want to get some cash in to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'd also want for the one for the people that I'm employing or if they go self-employed to who are doing the actual um, calling of the patients and converting. So there would have yeah. to be. So uh, you can have a consultancy agreement for yeah. self-employed people. And then obviously yeah. you have an employment contract for fully employed people. You can get you can find online HR companies that will help you do those. Yes. Um, there's Suzanne Dibble on um, Clubhouse is pretty good at keeping that very reasonable, isn't she? So I, I know her, but don't know. I can't say I've never used her. Fair but enough. I don't know her yet. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so I think we've um, we've gone through everything. I just how do I keep a work life balance? Because <laughs> I'm 60 this year and I'm getting old and knackered. <laughs> you don't look 60. <laughs> have you still got your dogs yes, yes. Yeah. well i'm a dog lover as well and uh that's great you've got your dogs to keep you sane during the lockdown stuff like that yeah 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 they they massive i do my thinking time i multitask all the time you know everything is you know even when i'm doing a clubhouse i'm doing my skincare because nobody yeah. can see me <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so well, yeah the worst thing that I've learned through this lockdown is the thing that makes you most depressed is actually doing nothing. The more you do, the happier you are, really. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I find that helping other people helps me for sure. Absolutely. It's annoying, but, you know, self-gratification, drinking a bottle of wine and eating loads of food doesn't actually make you happy. It's actually doing things for other people that makes you happy. It's annoying because yeah. I'd rather have a bottle of wine and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I've learned that that doesn't make you happy. I've just seen somebody put up a message that they've got an ace lawyer. So I'll... Hina, yeah, Hina's part of our supporter community. She's yeah, great. and she's always on. She's really, really helpful. So I will um, be great. really pleased to get in touch with her. Thank you. Can I, I just like to thank you so much. I've got so much from it. I'm so excited. I still am excited. Thank you very much. You're such great guys. Thank you. That's a pleasure, Jane. 
Um, so I, I wrote a book called Routine Equals Results, if you want a bit of help with your life work balance. Yeah, yeah I've got um, it. <laughs> right. Implement the actions in there then, Jane. There's not too it. many. Yeah, <laughs> this is the thing. I've got books and all the courses. It's implementing it all. When all is said and done. More is said <laughs> than done, yes. <laughs> and for anyone else watching, uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Jane, for uh, doing this and getting a, a bulk okay. order from Reinvent Yourself. So anyone watching, if you get a, a bulk order of Reinvent Yourself and message me, you, we might be able to uh, hook up a mentoring session live with myself, um, yourself and Gerald. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. Bye. Bye. Rob, I'm, I'm going to take this time.